Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Alternative Cycling Network, where we give you hot takes uh, on the bike industry, always unsponsored and unfiltered. Uh, I'm Russ, one of your co-hosts, and we are uh, joined by uh, my other co-host, Eric from Spin That. <laughs> and you're in, in the, the sauna, sauna today. <laughs> <laughs> Sweat. <laughs> and Mike from Locked In. And uh, we're uh, going to have a special guest after we get through the, the business. We're going to have Mike, uh, another Mike from the brand Fairdale, which is a pretty cool company, which I don't think a lot of people know about, but they do some really interesting things. But before we get to Mike from Fairdale, uh, let's do some channel updates. Eric, aside from being in the sauna, what else is new on the channel? Uh, um, uh. <laughs> What do you Shit. make videos of? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Eric, I, you did the tubeless <laughs> video. You did the tubeless yeah. tires. I oh, I did. I tubeless, yeah, I tubeless the Redwood. Yeah. Uh, and I also, I know that... Uh, you did the camera the, video. I made a, I made a camera video. I reviewed a camera. And I also made a video about how to install pedals and not ruin crank sets, which did the best out of all, all three. A PSA, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nice. How about you, Mike? What's what's been going on on Locked In? <laughs> uh, so I just did uh, basically my video of how I kind of I call it the road mode version of my Cobalt like Monster Cross bike and the parts I switch out, things that work that I was really surprised at, um, and some just kind of nuances that I noticed between the two for someone interested in taking a you know their gravel bike and an easy way to convert it and how it's going to kind of feel different. Um, and so I'm going to do a more in-depth version of that later of like actual part swapping and like disc rotor alignment and all that kind of stuff later, but it's just kind of a general overview. It did really, really well. And thank you for everyone who watched, uh, come, like <laughs> in a video, I was like, ah, I'll get a couple of views. Did really yeah. good. Uh, and then tomorrow I have, um, my locked in favorite Fridays is going to launch. I have a, uh, a pump I've been using that works, uh, really well for both my tire sizes. So for everyone interested, it's. I have a 700 by uh, 32C setup and uh, my 650 by 2.2, and I've been using the same pump, um, and it's like under 100 grams. And I've I got this new like cool way to mount it um, from this company on uh, basically it's like a quick release mount for it. It's all shot cord, so it's really yeah, easy cool. to take on and off because I don't like rare, like using like bringing a pump with me unless it's like warranted uh, or like a, a gravel ride. So like when I'm road bike like on my road bike, I just have CO2. Um, so it's really yeah. easy to like take it on and off. Um, it works really well. So I got that coming tomorrow and a lot of stuff for next week. So, yeah, cool. <clears throat> uh, on pathless pedal, the uh, busy week, we, uh, I did a review on the Kona Libre aluminum. Uh, so that's up. And then I did, um, an interview with James who started the company pedaling innovations that makes a catalyst pedal. So that's super big pedal. And we talked about the benefits of, uh, mid mid foot pedaling. But also the the clipless conspiracy and how uh, you know if you're not promoting clipless pedals, uh, you, you kind of have a hard time in the bike industry. And what else? Uh, and today, a couple hours ago, just uh, published a video giving you guys kind of an overview of different uh, front bag options for the bike. So busy week uh, on all our channels. Uh, we're gonna jump into one of my favorite sections, which is reader rides. And we've got some interesting bikes and a hack uh, this week. So this is from Jay Paterno. Uh, not too many notes, but it's a Linsky. Uh, it's got some i9 wheel wheels. Uh, I thought you'd appreciate the colors, Mike, that that are on oh, yeah. this bike. And th that's like a real expensive option to like pick individual spoke <laughs> color. You can do that for anyone who really is interested in doing that. i9 lets you like that's like the custom three option, and you can literally individually pick hubs like front to rear and individual spoke color it's ridiculous but wow. on him. yeah uh i've not ridden a, a linsky have you guys hopped on on any of their bikes no. I, I know that they're made in the u.s somewhere i think yeah. like in east tennessee or, or in tennessee That's uh, right, yeah. yeah interesting bike okay this one this is a bike by james uh gornell it's a surly bitch uh, bridge club one by twelve um VO crazy bars, uh, indeed pretty crazy. Uh, ESI grips on the sweep. I just installed uh, my first pair of ESI grips. Have you guys done that before? Yep. It's a. Uh, what was your? Do you use alcohol or I've I've learned about three different methods. One, using alcohol and just shoving it on uh, air compressor, which I ended up doing. And do you know about the zip tie method? 
Uh, no, I use the hairspray method. Okay, the hairspray method. Because <laughs> it, it goes on wet, you slide it on, and then it tacks up, so it helps it from rolling. Yeah. Well, if you ever get a chance, there's a, one guy... I've never I never liked the hairspray method. No. <laughs> the, the zip tie method is super fascinating. So basically, you, you start it on, and then you get four or five really long zip ties, right. and you shove it through, so they uh, pop uh, out the open end. And that basically acts as a sled for you to, to kind of... Sh to shim it or shimmy it on the handlebar. Um, what else is on this? Uh, Thompson seat <laughs> post, fabric saddle. Hey, uh, JP yeah. just commented he uses, he literally uses spit. I just saw that in the wow. chat. No. <laughs> <laughs> See here, here in Missoula, like we actually have a hard time finding uh, isopropyl alcohol. Um, it's still like in short supply. So I know when I had posted, you know, that I put ESI uh, grips on, someone had said that you could use Perel too. So if you have that oh. handy hand sanitizer, works. Mm. Um, and lastly, we will go to uh, the hack, reader hack, before we get to Fairdale Bikes. I thought this one was kind of cool. I'll play it. Um, hopefully you guys can hear this. All right. So it's a little quiet. It works. This is a cranking it up. Mono 11 to 51. Can you guys hear the audio? I'll narrate. Eagle so cage. you basically took a, a NX Eagle cage, tripper. put it on a rival derailleur, last. and he's yeah. running a Shimano 11 to 51 uh, cassette. He's not even bottomed out. So, and he said it works good. So if you, if you had any uh, qualms um, about doing it with a 11 to 51, it does, does indeed work. That's awesome. So I thought this was a, a good dovetail to um so our previous pack yeah i uh shimano 11 to 50. yeah i had my buddies uh fargo and we had an 11 to 50 on his rival uh and that i have a video on that and that worked and it still had some b limits so i could see like a one tooth like you know working uh with that but yeah i mean it 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 shifts, <laughs> uh, it shifts. <laughs> uh, but the uh, the Garbrook or whatever, or like a road link or whatever, does help uh, strain on the derailleur at the uh, the limits, you know, of that. But yes, physically will go into gear. <laughs> nice. All right. And speaking of more derailleur hacks, let's go into the new new. This has been making the rounds on the internet, mm -hmm. and it's uh, there's a video out of someone hacking a SRAM um, drivetrain so you can get a uh, 13 speed mechanical. I think uh, yep. if you, have you guys seen the video? He basically I orders did, yeah. some of the internals from some, some dude in Germany and it's, it's steps so it'll, it'll do uh, yeah. 13 steps. Yeah, so that's what I said. Yeah, so is it just machine to have mechanism. 13? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's the internal ratchet he replaces in the shifter you know, and anyone who knows the SRAM shifter, you can actually like when you remove that cover, you can see it like kind of, you know, notching itself. And so that gives him the 13 clicks. And then he takes a 12 speed like cassette with essentially like what would be an extender that they used to add to like the 10 speed to give you like the bigger wide, like mm -hmm. wide range before Eagle was out. And he puts that on an XDR hub drive body because that has the space taken out of it. Because it gives oh, you that okay. extra. So just like so, XD hub drive bodies, you can run a 12 speed mountain group, but you can't run the new 12 speed road group because it needs the extra needs the extra millimeter. So you'd run a, a spacer if you put the mountain cassette on there. So what he's doing essentially is taking the road cassette or a mountain cassette 12 speed cassette with a extra piece to essentially make up the spacer gap to give you that 13. Yeah. I thought one thing that was interesting, uh, the there's that journalism term uh, burying the lead, uh, is if you look in the comments section, so blah, 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 blah. So basically something SRAM could do. And then John responds, a builder who will remain nameless is now uh, working on a DIY kit to convert Eagle mountain bike derailleurs to the same geometry as road derailleurs. Uh, so clearly a demand. Uh, mm -hmm. SRAM not really making it easy, but there are some kind of yeah. um there's a lot of sram hacking going on <laughs> yeah um, i'm still and... like 10 speed i would like to just yeah. say <laughs> like my 10 speed bikes are working so good um <laughs> just i just i don't know why i felt you know compelled to say that but <laughs> yeah 
10 yeah, speed. I just bought a, I, I just bought a nine speed bike with a <laughs> so. with, with with two chain rings. So like I you know <laughs> it's gotta be worth something, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next week, it's all going to be out how we're all converting to 26 inch. That's uh, right. <laughs> That's big trend. Do, do funny, it next week. For, funny yeah. you say that. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, the last piece of new new before we go to our guest. Uh, this one I thought was interesting. Um, our friend Rob Perks from Ocean Air Cycles sent this along. He's the guy that started the coffee outside hashtag, you know, making, you know, brewing coffee on the bike a thing. This is from a Japanese brand. And one of the challenges if you're a coffee nerd is, you know, if you're using a V60 is pouring the water just right. If you're using a camp mug because it just kind of spills out. So this uh, is a little add on spout that you can add to any <laughs> um, camp coffee mug. And it costs 10,000 yen, which I know that's uh, like I was really two, mil two million Canadians. <laughs> I think that seems right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see here. I got my uh, I'm using my face. Hang on. Let's see. Ten thousand yen. Dude, I mean, this is definitely a, like a specifically nerdy okay. thing. Okay. It's still not cheap. I just like I thought it was like ten dollars. That is ninety three dollars and sixty six U S dollars, roughly. Oh dang. So yes, this is still and and uh, look how look yeah wow is that made out of it's like, only titanium? it's only nine grams. Uh, okay, it's I titanium. Think it's got to be. I think it might it's be not... tie. Yeah, there's also Man. well, there's also that diamond that's on it there too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and An ease of installation, and it comes in an artisanal tin. Oh, well, um, that's where the ninety-five dollars is at. Yeah, got it. Right, yeah. and it's it's made wow. by by monks. Um, wow. But yeah, I can I dig that forged forged in the mountains of uh, somewhere. Yeah, exactly. yeah, in Japan yeah. by monks. <laughs> yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. Cool. And uh, lastly, we're gonna hop on to our special guest uh, today. We're gonna talk with Mike from Fairdale Bikes, a uh, pretty cool bike brand. I know a little bit about them, Eric. I feel like you, you probably know more. But let's introduce uh, yes. Mike to the stream. Howdy! Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Oh, wait, I forgot to unmute you. Sorry. Okay, now you can speak. All right. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Cool. Uh, it, quick, really quickly in the YouTube chat, if you are familiar with Fairdale, let us know. If you write a Fairdale, let us know. And what, let us know where you're watching from. We've got uh, almost 100 people in the room. So we'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, so, so, Mike, for those that aren't familiar with the brand, can you tell us a little bit about the, the history? Sure. Um, so Fairdale Bikes, uh, we originated in Austin, Texas, for anyone who isn't aware of that part. Um, we are actually part of Odyssey BMX, Sunday Bikes. Fairdale is our uh, what we consider our adult bike brand within this group, um, and then all distributed through full factory distribution. Um, so the origins is really, you can't really talk about the origins without talking about Taj Mihalic. Um, if anyone is aware of Taj, then you kind of have a good idea of his style and his um, illustrations. If you aren't, you may have seen him in Bicycling Magazine. You may have seen his illustrations um, throughout Pink Bike. Um, he's really been kind of just doing a lot of art within the cycling industry at the moment. Um, and Taj was a pro rider for Odyssey BMX. Um, and as he got older and as he really had some back injuries, um, he was looking for ways to kind of give back to the company that helped him, you know, continue his pro career. And Fairdale sort of just spawned out of him wanting to provide bikes to his friends who were musicians and were artists and really didn't want to go down the route of, hey, what is this triple front and this 10 in the rear and these drop bars? What is all this stuff? Um, and Taj really started kind of creating these one-off bikes for his friends and kind of hodgepodging some things together. Um, he was riding for giant bikes, you know, at this time, and he was taking giants and just modifying them to be a little bit more fun for himself. And he sort of turned that idea into a sales pitch to, you know, to the, to the Odyssey brand and said, like, what, you know, what? Do you want to do with this and, and odyssey mainly this guy chris who's our head designer and one of the leaders within the company was like let's start a bike brand you know what do you want to do and then that really just that freedom that they gave taj to um to start to experiment that's really what led us into starting the first bike which was the parser and then led into what is still one of our flagship bikes the weekender um so over the last eight years or so nine years um fairdale's 
definitely evolved and, and the, the demands for what we want to create and the demands for what our customers wanted has kind of changed and gone left and right. Um, but yeah, so now we do everything from um, fairly high end road and gravel bike or frame and fork kits to like $450, $500 complete bikes for, you know, for the everyday person. Um, so one of the things that Fairdale sort of says is like, we like to make bikes for people who don't ride bikes. Um, and right. I know that's not really the market that a lot of bike companies go towards, but it feels really natural for like a, a company that has a lot of BMX history to go into the, what I consider the adult bike market with a little bit more of a fun approach and a little bit more of like a, a realistic approach for somebody who isn't really comfortable with, you know, a derailleur at all. Um, so that's sort of the standpoint of where we began. And now we're pretty deep to the point where we've had titanium bikes, we've had really high end gravel bikes. Um, and yeah, we've done trips to France, we've done trips to Glacier Park in Montana. Um, and yeah, he's done rides across Japan. So um, now we have distributors around the world and we have bike shops all throughout the country. And, um, and yeah, Fairdale is sort of just becoming a beast of its own now. Cool. Um... I, th I think that's fair because like, you know, I, I, me out of the three of us, I am the BMXer of the crew. And like, I'm the guy that goes to the skate park with my, you know, 700 C bike of sorts with my BMX strapped to my backpack <laughs> on the back. Cause I'm like, well, driving a car is stupid because like, you know, big cities, it's anytime you go to a skate park, there typically isn't great parking. Um, because cities haven't figured out that like BMXs, skateboards um, are not great ways of actually like truly getting around. Like you see, <laughs> when I was when I was thirteen to you know eighteen, it was fine because I didn't know any different. But now I'm twenty eight and I'm like I'm not riding this twenty inch single speed bike fifteen <laughs> k anymore. I'm just not doing it. Um, you don't have that so unlimited like, energy anymore, yeah, Eric. Well, I do, but it's just like I've not, now I've ridden, you know, I've ridden a, a 700c bike, and I know what it's like to actually ride something efficient. Um, <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'm just gonna like throw a bike on my back, and and you know, BMXs don't weigh that much. You know, modern BMXs don't. You know, anywhere from 19 to, to 22 pounds, so it's really not that bad to carry on your back. Um, but that is a question that comes up all the time. Is like lifetime BMXers truly don't know anything about bikes. Like I remember when I started working at a bike shop and I was like, derailleur, not shifting, hit it with a hammer and that will fix it. <laughs> that's not the way to do it. So like, um, and like, but that's the BMX mentality, right? So I get a lot of questions from, from BMXers and skateboarders like, well, what should I get? Because like, you know, this thing looks sick. You know, what, what do I get? Um, and there isn't a great place to push anybody for that. Um, like there's no, like they're like, I don't know, I just want something kind of simple. And you're like, well, you can either get a fixed gear or like some, you know, kind of crappy single speed. Um, but that's sad that those are all just kind of like band-aid fixes. That's not actually what anybody truly wants. So like, you know, everything you guys make, I think is probably like really what the, the non cycling people probably would truly be looking for, but they don't know that. Like they didn't know that at all. Yeah, you really hit the nail on the head. I mean, you know, right now we're having a lot of success with um, a lot of the, the Southern California skateboarders. Um, they they see our skate rack and, and they kind of put two and two together and they say like, wait, I could just put my skateboard on a bike and I can pedal to the park. I can pedal to the street spot. I can pedal to my homie's house, whatever it might be. And now all of a sudden I'm a skateboarder who can now, I have a 20 mile radius instead of yeah. a three mile radius. And, and it's really similar with BMXers, whether it's an injury or whether it's just getting older, you start to realize like, man, pedaling this 20 inch bike is blowing out my lower back. It's exhausting. My, my gearing's up. I ride a, I ride a significantly harder gear than you would ride on a, any normal bike. So after a while climbing hills, you're, you're over it. Whereas if you can start to point some people into the direction of even a single speed 700C or a 27.5 Taj that we have, now you can sit down, you can raise the seat, you can just, you can actually start to add some miles to your trip. Um, and it really starts to open it up and you, people start to realize like, oh yeah, bikes are fun. Like that's the, that's the thing that with Fairdale, we want people to realize like you can be an artist, you can be a skateboarder, you can be a BMXer. But like, if you can get on one of our bikes and use it as a tool to have fun and use it as a tool to get from where you are to where you want to go, then like, that's a win-win for all of us. So 
while we aren't really the the specialized racing graphics slanted you know slanted racing graphics um we are really like kind of like the everyman's bike for the most part mm -hmm. yeah i feel like um I love the the phrase uh, "adult bike market" because I feel like that, <laughs> that 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 describes perfectly all the new cyclists that are just discovering bikes because of COVID. You know, yeah. So I, I feel like that that must lead to. I mean, have you guys had more demand since the uh, pandemic? Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, I assumed you would ask about the pandemic to some degree. Um, yeah, it's it's astronomical. I mean, it's to the point where it's almost frustrating. It's impossible for us to create the amount of bikes that people are asking for. Um, and even when we forecast like a, a, we double our manufacturing, we're still not reaching the demand that the American public is really looking for right now. That part has been really flattering. It's been it's been motivating, but at the same time, it's it's difficult. Um, what happens next year when People are used to this. Are they still going to come in in you know every single day to bike shops looking for bikes? So yes, we have um, a significant amount of bikes back ordered, much more than I would like to have back ordered. In the sense of I want these people to have the bike rather than be waiting for it. Um, and uh, and yeah, but it's really going to be helpful for the overall growth with Fairdale. Like now we've gotten into more bike shops because they see the demand. Even a BMX shop, they're like, oh, we we actually can sell these bikes now. Um, yeah. So yeah. COVID or the pandemic, whatever you want to call it, it, uh, it has definitely been a significant bump to pretty much the entire bicycle industry. And for us, it's been, it's been a blessing, but it's been difficult to adjust to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you yeah, see how does it in supply like, uh, like shipment times since you guys have predominantly more like single speed bikes or bikes that don't, you're not, you're not waiting on like a, a component group manufacturer per se as much. You would think, but um, but then we run into a tire delay, and it doesn't matter if you're single speed or whatever. You know, once you have a tire <laughs> delay, you, you don't have tires on your bike. Um, and and for the most part, it's been really good for us. The like from the business side of it, we adapted to place orders way earlier. Like as soon as it happened, we kind of gauged the market and figured out like, do we need to relax or do we need to ramp it up? And as soon as we got the signs that were saying like, oh my God, every shop is asking us for more bikes than they've ever ordered from us. Then it, we started doing our second order and our third order. And, and now we've actually, today we pretty much just wrapped up all of our 2022 ordering, not just the bikes, but we actually have the actual order breakdown for the 2022 models. Because if we don't, we're just going to be late. You know, um, so we're adjusting internally. Um, we're like I said, we're really thankful that like, you know, this is sort of like a free pass for people to to build their bicycle industry or build their bicycle business and help bike shops and get more people on bikes, which helps all of us. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been as easy as you would think with people like knocking on your door asking for bikes because between friends asking for bikes and then really, really good bike shops asking for bikes, it's really difficult to say like, so I'll have bikes in November for you. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it's not yeah. it's not when they want the bikes. So, yeah. um, but it, it, it's like, been you got these YouTubers who are like, "Can I have a bike?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, but it, it, it's been really nice to to see the bicycle industry grow, and, and obviously, it's happened in other industries. We've heard it from skateboarding. Um, I'm even hearing it with like the power sports industry on the outdoor side of things. Um, it's really great. People are actually enjoying the outdoors again, and people are actually willing to get whether they consider it being healthy or not is one thing, you know, but they will in turn become healthier if they start riding more bikes and go camping on the weekends and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome, but demand is at an all time high and supply is now being, you know, constrained because everyone, you know, between the biggest manufacturers and the smallest manufacturers, we're all trying to, you know, essentially double our orders or more. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's great and it's tough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. So really quickly in the YouTube chat, we've got uh, Hollywood represented, Texas, Ohio, uh, London, Moscow, Russia, uh, Buffalo, oh, wow. New York, Clovis, California, Sacktown, Costa Rica. <laughs> I love Costa Rica. Uh, state of Jefferson. <laughs> so that's northern, the, the true North California is like a state, yeah. state of Jefferson folks will say. May as well uh, be cool. BC. Right. <laughs> Um, so out of, uh, your, 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 your slay of the bikes, like, is there, what's your, what's the best seller? 
Um, I mean, well, the right best, now they're all bestsellers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The bestseller is our look far. Um, mainly, you know, it's a really affordable price. You, you know, you get eight speeds with it. So like the person who's never had a geared bike, that's sort of the introduction to a geared bike is the look far for us. Um, mm -hmm. for, for our friends and for skateboarders who don't really care about bikes, this is sort of a perfect bike for, for that and introduction. But ultimately, this is a watered down version of uh, the Archer Weekender. The Archer Weekender is what I kind of consider like that is Fairdale. Um, and that's that hasn't really changed in our line besides tire sizing and, you know, really small spec changes. Um, but yeah, that bike right there, that Archer Weekender, if I could get every single person to ride that one, um, we'd all be happy. Like that bike mm. is awesome. The, the Nomad is basically an upgraded version and a drop bar version of that, but they literally keep the same frame, um, same fork. It's just, you know, you put an outboard bottom bracket and a nicer crank on there. You put a drop bar on there, drop levers, and all of a sudden it's $300, $400 more expensive. Right. Um, yeah. But but yeah, that, that Archer Weekender, it, if I could have one sales pitch, it would probably be this one. Yeah. <clears throat> so who, like, who do you think this, this bike best suits? Is this just the, the person that's wanting to get like their first kind of nicer bike or where does it fit in? Like who's the customer? So, so the, I mean, honestly, the customers that we've had really vary. A lot of it just has to do with, do you have $850, $900 to spend on a bike? You know, so that's right. the first hurdle is, is how much money is my friend willing to spend or how much money is the customer willing to spend? Um, but if that person is like, that's the range they want to be in, this bike can literally be a city bike or with the 27.5 and the fatter tires, like the Continental Double Fighter tires are essentially a mountain bike tire. So like you can ride fire roads, you can ride pretty much any sort of um, bike path with this bike. So I consider this to be pretty much the most versatile bike, but it is a very upright riding position. So you're not in an aggressive position. So if you really like drop bars, if you really like road racing, it's probably not gonna be the bike for you. Um, but if you, aren't really comfortable on a bike, you're not eating the front wheel the way you would be on a road bike. Um, and you're in a really comfortable position to to just feel safe and to feel like, um, you know, whether it's your first bike or whether like this was my, I've had four of these, I think, um, just different colors and different years. And it's just the most comfortable, easy to ride bike. So whether it was your girlfriend who just wants a bike or whether it was somebody who, who they don't want to ride their $5,000 road bike everywhere. Um, it really right. wouldn't matter. Like it's a full chromoly frame, full chromoly for all SRAM shifting. So it's, you know, avid disc brake. So it's like, it's everything that you really need as long as you're not like the three guys I'm talking to are going to custom build every single bike that you ever own. Right. Uh, right. So, so yeah, I, I think <laughs> as long what? as we don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you guys, but I'm pretty sure that's what it's <laughs> But like, that's, you know, that, when I was working in the shop for three years, people come in. the The number one question they ask is like, "I, I want to, I want a bike. I want it to be good. I don't know what good is." Um, and then they don't know that they want a simple bike, but basically what they're explaining is a simple bike because they're like, "I don't know. Do you still have to do that like both sides thing?" <laughs> and you're like, "Yeah, no. Like every bike at that time still had a triple." Like whether it was yeah. a hybrid, whether it was like touring bike, you know, road bikes had doubles, but like, you know, one by was still kind of just coming out. And like my biggest complaint was like, I wish every flat bar, like I called these fitness bikes because people got turned off by, uh, turned off by the, the term hybrid. Oh, yeah, um, sure. So I'm like, yeah, this is like a flat bar <laughs> road bike or like, this is like a, like a, and they're like, what's the difference? And I'm like, eh. You know, <laughs> I, 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 no, I, I, I was the same way. Like, oh, it was weird. It was only, like the the nicer hybrids in the shop when I managed mine, like they still had doubles, and I was yeah. just like aching for the one by system. Even if even if it was, you know, an uh, an eight to a ten speed, depending on the price yeah, like point. one with like a chain guard. Even if it was yeah. non clutch, like whatever. Exactly, like it just it would be so much simpler because my my preface was when somebody come in, and even sometimes with a hybrid which has a bigger tire than a road bike, they're like, oh, I want a road bike, and they'll look at it like. I really don't want a road bike, you know, after they, they see the small tires and even a hybrid 35 to a 38 C seemed small to some people because they were coming from a cruiser or something. This would be that nice transition. It's simple because it has this, the one shifter and I wish all hybrids, fitness bikes all had single rings um, just because of that, because it would definitely 
you know, having to teach people, okay, well, you know, one to three on this side is different than one to nine on this side. And then all that kind of confusion, I think this, this simplifies it. And also too, like for me, like running around town, like I don't want to have to think about it. I'm just, you know, poking around and, and I think having the bigger tire volume for, again, somebody who's coming from maybe a cruiser or like an old 26 inch mountain bike, who's like, wants to ride more or that bike's just so decrepit now they need a new one. Uh, this kind of like hits home for that. Yeah. That simplicity is, is definitely kind of part of our, uh, our goal when we're creating a bike, like every bike has its own goal, whether it's a price point or whether it's the, the quality of it or whether it's the overall build. Um, but that simplicity that, like I said, uh, originally when I'm talking about the story of Fairdale, it's like, we want a person who's never really ridden a bike to be able to get on this bike and have confidence that they're in a comfortable position and that right. if it's only one thumb shifter, they at least are like, well, that was the wrong direction. Now I only have to go down to this one, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it's just in the bigger tires, like you run over a rock, you run over a root, you run over a loose stick and you don't care when you have 2.0s or 2.2s, but if you have 28 C's, like that's no fun for a new person. Um, so yeah, it's it, the simplicity is really important, and and obviously Fairdale, as we grow, it doesn't always have to stay within that simplicity. Um, but what's really helped Fairdale, you know, have continued followers, and what's had been really easy to get people onto the bikes, really is like both the artistic style of the graphics and artistic style of the brand as a whole, and the simplicity of the ride. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah what's your so how do people buy your bikes or do you go primarily through through bike shops or do people buy consumer direct? So um, we are like everything in our business design is to go through bike shops. Uh, we prefer to go through bike shops. We have some really amazing partners um, with bike shops, but with the difficulty of getting a brand out to every corner of the country and every you know little city and every little suburb, um, I think two years ago or so, we actually started offering our bikes on the web store or just on fairdalebikes.com there's absolutely nothing that you can buy on our website right now for, you know, for a complete bike that is, you can find some t-shirts and, you know, feel free to browse the, <laughs> the, browse the t-shirt section and yeah, the, you know, merch, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. feel free to, feel free to browse fairdalebikes.com. But ultimately, if we have um, a real normal quantity of bikes, we do want to have some available on our web store, not necessarily just for like our profit margin, really more because somebody in a certain part of Ohio is 300 miles away from a Fairdale dealer. And that makes it really difficult for us to, to grow our brand and to, to allow somebody who's stoked on the brand and they're really into it, but Hey, like, I don't know where the heck I can get this thing. Um, so yeah. if, if we did everything direct, our pricing would drop and that would be really nice, but we really like to support bike shops. We think it's really important for the average consumer who our brand really goes towards they really should be going to a shop and, and having a mechanic work on their bike and at least starting with a really well-built, really you know fine-tuned bike so that when they don't work on it for three years, at least it has a better chance of surviving, you know? Being okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's true. We So a number of, of friends of mine who are BMXers, um, when everyone kind of saw what I was doing and they're like, well, geez, you know, maybe road riding does seem kind of fun. Um, of course, we all, you know, of course, I'm just going to keep lobbing softball comments to, to you guys. Um, but like, we we all wanted Fairdales because we're like, well, we all ride Odyssey forks. Um, you know, everybody's got an Odyssey hub, except for me, I have profile hubs. But uh, like, we're like, well, it just kind of makes sense. Uh, we all want to ride like BMX cranks and stuff on our road bikes because we're not ready to jump into this world yet. But there was, there was no, th there wasn't a way for us in Nova Scotia to really get a Fairdale because no one wanted to take on the new distributor. Uh, no one wanted to, you know, all the, the steps in the bureaucracy that comes with trying to get a, a bike shop to take on a new right. company. Yeah. And they're like, you know, okay, well, tell me about Fairdale. And you're like, okay, so there's this like ragtag group of guys. Like, <laughs> five of us here in Nova Scotia. And we all think we would really like to buy one of them. Guaranteed five purchases. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> but, like like a good, but, like a good, but on sale. Like, but yeah. like five yeah, we're all we, we all BMX. Uh, so good deals, but five guys for sure. Yeah. 
That is not a rare. That is not a rare story. Uh, I've heard that story yeah. from multiple areas in the country. Uh, but you guys are the guys who really do help us get into shops. Ultimately, you know, because yeah. even if three people show up and they say, "Hey, look at this Taj. Look at this Weekender. Look at this little car." Like at a certain point, the shop's got to say, "Oh, I guess I can apparently sell these things because I've had multiple people come in." So those ragtag group of guys that you're talking about, like you kind of serve as like sales ambassadors for us because it's really like we are everyone who works at Fairdale also works at Odyssey and also works at Sunday and also works at G sport and also works at full factory. So it's not like I'm on the road every day, hustling Fairdale's and going to shop to shop to shop to sell them. It's like, we do sort of rely on a little bit of that grassroots and a little bit of that street team um, to be like, Hey, we, we hooked up this guy in New York city with a, you know, with a parser or with a weekender, Hopefully five people see that and maybe maybe his shop or maybe one of his homie shops is like, we'll take that bike. That bike looks really cool. Um, and it's the, the, that organic growth has actually been great because that means the people who are actually riding a Fairdale are like they were already stoked on it before they even got it. And having them be our like ambassadors throughout the, you know, throughout the bicycle industry, it's it's been really great. Um yeah, because you know we we don't have twenty sales reps out there, you know, saying, "Hey, no, why don't why don't you buy fifty of these instead of forty of these?" You know, it's like yeah, you're gonna it, need to take more. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, we uh, we aren't we aren't that company yet. Or you got to look at Bill the Cat's video or comment. It's a uh, five is twenty percent market penetration in Nova <laughs> <laughs> which is not bad. <clears throat> It's not bad. <laughs> Fair deal. Big in Nova Scotia. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, awesome. Do you find? I know that like whenever we, whenever when travel was a thing, we'd always go to different bike shops, <laughs> and um, I felt like a majority of the bike shops are very performance oriented, and they sell yeah. to the enthusiasts. Did you have a tough time kind of getting you know the, the bike, bike shops to carry? The brand because it, it wasn't focused on the the super hardcore enthusiasts yeah i mean i think you, the majority of bike shops are really well trained i mean it started with schwinn and then now you have specialized in trek that are pretty much dominating bike shops and you know what they're trying to push you know you know what their goals are um so when you have a brand like us who we literally don't share any of those same goals other than we want people on bikes um that has been a hurdle because we have a really, really great distribution when it comes to the BMX side of things. And we have really great partners when it comes to the BMX side of things. But then when you introduce this bike to them, they're like, well, that's not what we sell from you. And then, so I go to a regular bike shop and then they're like, well, I have all these specialized or I have all these hybrid bikes or I have all these every other brand. Um, and it really did take a lot of legwork. And, and luckily for us, everyone who's in this company has been in the bicycle industry for years and years and years and years. Like nobody's new within our group. So we do have people who are friends with owners of bike shops. We're friends with people who, whether they started one or managed one, whatever it might be. And we actually got some really great, like like bike source. I know they have like a, like a kind of wide reach, but the one in Colorado, our, one of our ambassadors, Leif, worked there. So we got into a specialized dealer, you know? Um, Bicycle Sport Shop down here in Austin is one of our closest partners. They don't need to support us the way that they support us, but they see what our vision is and they see the hole in the market. And they also see that the Austin audience wants this. Austin audience doesn't want a fluorescent whatever racing bike, you know? they. They really have a little bit more of a, you know, refined style, or I, I guess a more artistic style, or more like, don't give me this crazy tubing carbon fiber bike. Um, so when we started to get a few of these people on board, the snowball started to roll a little bit easier because then we say, hey, I have bicycle sports shop down here in Austin, and they're doing hundreds of bikes. You can bring in twenty five. You know, like you can, you know, you can kind of get it going. And then with like, so Sunday bikes is the other bike brand that we distribute um, and we create the growth of Sunday has also helped the growth of Fairdale because the more that people were buying through us, the more that they were like, Oh yeah, I had two people come in and ask me about Fairdale, but you guys are Fairdale. Like the connecting of the dots is, is been a, you know, a multi-year process. Um, but it's still not easy. Like to just go walk into a specialized or Trek dealer and cold sell them it's super difficult um but luckily we've had both bmx riders who work in the shop like cooler guys who work in the shop who we've had a lot of mechanics at dealers who they say yo i can't bring your bike in yet 
but I really want to EP a bike. I really want to EP a good ship. I really want to EP a rocket ship. I really want to EP a space ship. Like I want what you have, but I can't convince them to bring it in yet. That, like I said, that grassroots style has been like a big leverage to our success. Um, and like social media has actually helped like by us being shared by really cool people on social media, there have been people who have noticed. So our dealer base is growing. Our distributor base is, gr is growing, but I would be heavily lying to you if I said it was an easy, like, you know, just plug and play. Here's, you know, here's the same bike Specialized has because it's not that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it, some of it's really good relationships and other of it is just like organic growth. But but no, it's not like the easiest thing in the world to, you know, to change the, the flow of a bike shop sales. Yeah. Do you think there's any more? Do you think bike shops are going to be more receptive? receptive of Fairdale because of the pandemic? Cause it seems to, you know, like, I look again, the adult bike market, you know, it seems like you cater to them, uh, you know, other brands that focus on the high end endurance or, you know, performance side, um, in some ways are kind of playing catch up. <laughs> yeah. The, the pandemic's helped. I mean, it's honestly helped in our distributors too. Um, with our distributors, they said, Whoa, uh, we brought in 20 Fairdales and all of a sudden we have people who want them. Um, but they, they really were willing to take that risk because they felt that pressure of like, we can sell bikes to anyone right now. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we've had some of our BMX shops bring in more Fairdales because of the pandemic. We've definitely opened more dealers and maybe frustrated some dealers that we don't have the models available for them. That's been the hardest part with the pandemic. They want bikes and now nobody has bikes. So it's, it's a, we haven't seen the true potential of, of this yet. Um, but like I said, we've, you know, the back orders that we have are significant. Um, the amount of new dealers that we have is great. The, you know, I, I really have a lot of optimism for like where our dealer base and where our distributor base is headed um, because it's not being so much of like a, Hey, this is a cool looking bike. It's like, Oh, I've heard of Fairdale or, Oh, I've seen a few of those come in the store. And as that happens more and more, it, it's, it's getting easier and easier to have that conversation with dealers. Cool. Yeah. My, my barber in uh, Missoula rides a Fairdale. Heck yeah. <laughs> so. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. You should find out uh, more about his, his history. I'm so, I, I'm always interested to find out like what the people who, who bought them are because, I'm such a nerd when it comes to <laughs> why the company is what it is. Cause I know every, everything about it, but like, um, I think further to, to what you were saying, Russ, like, um, you know, is, is a lot of companies or bike shops going to like maybe pivot towards the like adult bike, like more fun, um, yeah. side of things. Like I see that on, on a lot of companies' websites already. And like some of them, like some of them do a pretty good job of making it seem like that was always kind of their like uh, raison d'etre. Like, but right. if like you could see like a posting from them uh, from two years ago, like maybe it, instead of the word fun, it would say like performance. Um, right. <laughs> and like the picture might be a little bit more I intense. Um, and then others, like others do like a pretty good job of like, like, I think when, you know, for example, I think Rally did a pretty good job of trying to, like, rebrand away from being such a performance-oriented brand and come back to kind of seem a little bit similar to what to what you guys do at Fairdale, where it's like, okay, we're not going to be, like, an overly racing company again. You know, maybe we just build some cool bikes that, like, people – could just get on board with to, to have like a coaster break, like single speed. Like yeah. nobody mm -hmm. really was making steel 4130 coaster break single speeds. Um, I had two at the shop and they were too early. Like I could never yeah. sell them because it's like, <laughs> like trying to explain to someone in a shop, like imagine how much fun this would be. And they're like, I don't know what you mean at all. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, we, we knew we were on to the right direction and we knew we were on the right track when we started seeing the bigger guys like, I don't want to say they copied us because that's not accurate, but when you started to see the Fairdale style implemented into other brands, even if it wasn't specifically because of us, whether it was a colorway or whether it was just the style of bike that we built, you started to realize like, oh, we're kind of onto something now, you know, like this, the, the market's actually coming to us rather than us going to the market. Um, and that is, that's pretty satisfying if I'm being honest, you know, that's pretty cool to see like the market go from, 
hey, Lance Armstrong, Lance Armstrong, Lance Armstrong, why is everyone taking things so seriously? You know, like just watching that, like that circle of things and it's going to circle back around, you know, competition will be cool again eventually, you know, but I think, I think if we find our niche within the market and we have the capabilities of making really high performance stuff, we have the capabilities of making really great bikes, uh, but we also want to service a market that we felt like was underserved and um, and really wasn't even considered. You know, we were like I said, we were trying to get bikes for people who don't ride bikes, and that's mm-hmm. that's kind of a weird direction because you don't know what they want because they don't know what they want. Um, but luckily, yeah, we we've had some really great people within the company who had a really amazing vision, and um, and it's still going. But but yeah, it, it's it's definitely getting easier as the market becomes less and less performance based. Um, I mean, there's plenty of amazing performance stuff out there. And I I came from like a BMX racing background, so I'm a large fan of performance stuff. Uh, but from BMX freestyle side, the the brand for Fairdale, like it, it fits that demographic much, much better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I will say the people like- who, who uh, like bikes for people who, who don't ride bikes, what they want is they want to ride in flat pedal shoes and jeans. <laughs> Is what they yeah. want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're like, "What is this lycra?" I don't understand. Uh, it it took me a while before I put some lycra on, and then I said, "Oh, this is how you guys and ride fifty yeah, miles at a time." Gotcha. <laughs> uh, I'll just make sure I don't ride my road bike with flat pedals around you. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm actually I'm super on board with that now. I, Cool, cool. <laughs> Two or three years ago, I would have been one of those losers that's like, yeah. the, have you ever read the rules? And then, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm good uh, with it now. I'm, I'm I have clips and I, I definitely see the value in clips, but uh, especially when I like from my house to downtown Austin and back on my good ship, I'm on flat pedals because, you know, I can get out, I can walk around, I can take photos, I can kind of like be a regular human being. Um, and, you know, no offense to everything that we love, but when you're in spandex as a 30 year old man, it, it's, it's, it's hard to do. You get, you get looked at a little bit weird, you're you like, know? Let's just take a nice little picture here. <laughs> and you're clip, 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 clip. And you're like, no, nah, we're, we're cool. For people to look at you. <laughs> yeah. But then when you're on the bike, when you're actually on your awesome bike, you're like, this all makes sense. It's just yeah. as soon as you go to the coffee shop, you're like, yeah, oh, right. everyone's looking at it's my all, butt. Yeah, it's all, all context. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think like Mike, the, the I think Michael's is. muted over here. Mike, are you muted? Or your uh, did your audio die? Oh, yep, no he's audio. It's good uh, talking to you. <laughs> See you. So, switch switch back to the headphones. <laughs> um. I do like the uh, the the vibe of uh, the bikes. It doesn't. I feel like some brands, you know, their their goal is to usher you to be um, a racer. <laughs> That's like the ultimate end goal, you know, yeah. to bring you up through that process as if you graduate. But here, it's like you meet people where they are. You you know, if they want to do more than that, it's fine. But there's no like expectation. So. Yeah. Um, it's like yeah, you should and, be a skateboarder. <laughs> right. <laughs> a lot of that. A lot of this, like the way that Fairdale is and the style that Fairdale is, is really led to like, we've had some really amazing collaborations. We've had some really amazing people involved. Um, you know, we had a van shoe and a van's bike. We've had like some, you know, we had a built well bike, which you know, any motorcycle people like built well, the helmet company, like we had a built well bike in our line. Um, and all that was based around our BMX relationships. Anybody who knows the guy named Magoo, like he's a very big part of the nineties BMX world. Um, and probably before and after that, but the nineties, he was crushing it, um, probably early two thousands. But a lot of these like organic relationships, they all stem from like us just being the way that Fairdale is and not necessarily trying to be like, well, we're going to do this now, but our end goal is to, you know, is to have this amazing carbon fiber, $12,000 bike. Like I would take one, I would like to ride one, but like, I don't necessarily (laughs) think that that's part of our like business plan or, or really like, you know, a big goal of ours, but, but the titanium bike came out, we had a titanium traditional road bike and we had a mechanical and a, and a DI2 or or electric or electronic or whatever it would be called um, specific one. Like we can do those things. We, We can give you some really high quality stuff. So as Fairdale continues to grow, it'll be cool to see like, how we develop some of the high end and, and kind of how we continue with like our, our, like our normal market. Yeah. Yeah. 
Is, it, is this is this working? We You're can on. Hear you. All right. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. No, I was gonna say I saw Russ's video with the, the when you were talking about flat pedals. His those those Croc like lace ups. That's a thing. Those things are baller. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, like are those like that special like like I I know you ride in your your Crocs like regularly on flats, but like yeah. these are like like athletic looking Crocs, and I'd never. I mean, they, seen they look like Adidas Boost. You know? Yeah, like, right. They're, they're like yeah, like, like like man. <laughs> Still looking for the affiliate link on on those yeah sheets. yeah <laughs> right yeah I, I think that would take a Croc sponsorship <laughs> they're, they're, oh, yeah. if they did if they did an SPD I would I would go hundred percent try that <laughs> yeah I buy two pair no problem yeah. there you go there you go so so I'm curious when you when you when Fairdale ventures into like the really fancy stuff like the tie bike or, or road bike like is that to to test the market or to kind of stretch the image of the brand. Like, what's the thinking when, when you put out a bike like that that's supposed to, that, that's so different from everything else in the lineup? Um, it's actually to test our, not even test, it's to utilize our manufacturing capabilities. Um, okay. That's that's honestly what it is. So we have a really, really close relationship with a, a vendor that they specialize in titanium. So they're over here making BMX forks. They're over here making BMX cranks. And they're like, can you please challenge us can you can you give us you know, can you give us like a project so ultimately the titanium bike was you know essentially the factory saying or the the frame manufacturer saying like hey we could crush it with this thing like let us do this for you like you guys are making chromoly stuff that's awesome but like this is what we specialize in um so something that most people probably have no clue about with the with the spaceship is that that's whatever take it with a grain of salt i work for fairdale that's one of the best titanium frames welded and like built that you can really get like the vendor that makes that frame is the high-end titanium manufacturer um and and that's really where some of that stuff comes from we have like our head designer our lead designer one of the leaders within this company as a whole he's he has a road bike background so there's always like that well I, he had this specialized s works and then they're like why are you riding that thing why don't we make you a bike and then they made him a bike and they're like well why don't you make this bike and then they're like well why don't you let's make that bike in titanium so it's not necessarily <laughs> us trying to get you guys to buy a titanium bike it's really more of like hey you have all this manufacturing power in front of you and you have all this ability in front of you like utilize it um so that's more of the direction it came from it's not necessarily like maybe we could sell 500 titanium bikes it's like right they're throwing this titanium bike at us like let's 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 nurture that relationship and let's like keep going with it so i have a question about that so just just to humor me and i, I don't know what you can talk about or not but as far as i know for like carbon bikes versus uh like you know any kind of alloy bike is there an easier cost of entry to produce your titanium bike because you you have this idea or you want to try something is it easier than i'm assuming cost wise than doing a mold correct the the mold is really what you're that's that's really what we're avoiding here you know so right. while while we didn't we didn't go into the titanium bike to like we weren't looking for it. So I don't know right. if we were trying to make it what some of the hurdles would have been, because like I said, it was sort of like right in front of us. It was like literally getting held out right, right out in front of us. Um, but yeah, I mean, as soon as you go into carbon fiber, then now we have different mold fees and then we have different mold right. sizes. You're right. astronomically in a different world. Like um, I had a quote from like a BMX carbon fiber uh, friend and it was like hundred thousand dollars worth of molds. Like, we don't oh yeah, have no. I, I, that's not, <laughs> we don't have a mold. <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah. Because usually, what I've heard is is anywhere between twenty five to fifty thousand per size for a mold. Per size, yeah. So you need four and, or five but no, no one knows that. Yeah, exactly. And you need that. So that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I'm assuming for the steel, it's just your. It depending on if it's a custom geometry, maybe some jig, you know, fee, you know, like all, allocation for some money there. But besides that, I'd assume that would be easier cost of entry obviously material cost would go up because it's high and everything else but i'd assume that would be easier than going you know than going the carbon route 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say no to that. You know, um, again, there are you know there are fees that go into creating any new product, and basically every time you create a new product, it gives them an opportunity to requote you. You know, so whatever you right, did in right, the past, yeah. it's it's yeah. sort of irrelevant because you now have a new product. Um, but yes, it is it is much easier for us or for any brand ultimately to either make a chromoly bike or titanium. I can't speak too much of because it was too. It, it was basically like already within our company, so it's hard to fully judge what if you wanted to start to start a titanium frame, like what hurdles oh, yeah. you would have yeah, run yeah. into. But like, yeah, like we we don't have any interest in doing carbon fiber. Like, I really don't expect us to make anything in carbon fiber. But mm. we might make an aluminum bike eventually. We might make a mountain bike eventually. You know, we might do other things eventually that that's that broaden our our offering. Um, but. But yeah, it's always going to be much easier to just weld some tubes together than it is to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lay up carbon fiber and create molds for it, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. even I think even if you did open mold, it would be really, really difficult to justify some of yeah. those costs unless you really wanted to do it for the long term. So how some of these people justify it is that's their business, I guess. <laughs> Have you guys ever but had a, 40, a, a bike? Sorry, I was going to say a 4130 d d double suspension mountain bike from you guys on Sonia. <laughs> and, and honestly, that's the thing is like if you're stoked on that and we're stoked on that and it doesn't it's not really out there in the market much, then like we actually might have something there, you know. Yeah. Um, so it, it is kind of nice to go down our own path and, and to do things that seem genuine and, and, and organic to Fairdale um, rather than like, like I said, I have a racing background. So like sometimes I want to let's go full throttle, let's do it. But like the titanium bike basically was full throttle, you know, as far as that kind of stuff goes. Cool. Um, so in the YouTube comments, if you guys have any questions for Mike in, uh, from Fairdale, let us know. And if you guys are digging this video so far, give it a thumbs up. It helps view velocity and all that stuff. Uh, Mike, has there ever been a bike idea that uh, you guys thought would be too weird to bring to market? Uh, yeah, Taj has a lot of ideas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like a BMX you, rack on your, on the full size bike. <laughs> I mean, so if anybody hasn't watched it, I very much recommend you to go search for the Fairdale R and D videos. Um, Taj made a bike out of the Fender guitar. Taj made a bike out of a two by four. Taj made a bike out of pretty much anything that you could think of. He wasn't asking us to create those bikes necessarily. Um, but yes, the ideas that go through the R&D department, um, you know, for every titanium road bike that you see, there was five ideas that would just, whether it was financially didn't make sense or whether the market wasn't going to make sense or whether it was just like, hey, that's a nice idea, but oh my God, I can't believe you asked us to do that. You know? uh, yeah, there, there are definitely things that don't make it to, to real life. Um, and even stuff we're working on right now that may or may not make it to real life. But weird wise, the weird stuff's usually more of like a joke, but like, um, I was looking at some of our old bikes and like we made a parser, which isn't, this isn't weird, but like Taj was really, really dead set on making a parser that had two rear cogs, two separate single speed rear cogs so that if you want an easier gear, it's literally like two seconds. You can just loosen, tighten, you're done, you know? Yeah. Um, and he was just dead set on that. And we were kind of looking at him like, you can only ride one at a time. Like, I don't, I don't know, but, but we made it and we offered it as a complete bike. And it was, that was the stock parser was a two rear cog cassette hub. Like, and, and while that's not like insanely weird, those kind of ideas are really, you know, interesting. And, and he, Taj has those ideas. Our R and D department has those ideas. And even some of our sales staff, like we have a kid named Phil or a guy named Phil, who's like a big part of the Fairdale sales team. Um, and Phil's always got ideas that sometimes we're just like, ah, I don't know how we can really make that reality. Um, but if you see some of our, like our MX bikes, um, or even like the flyer that we have for this year, like when we do BMX riser bars on our, our, adult bikes um that is a kind of a weird idea that really stemmed okay. from like natural bmx riders being like i'd way rather have a five inch rise regular bmx style handlebar than this flat mountain bike bar you know or these sweat oh, yeah. archer bars uh um, like so, so some head, of those yeah, like yeah and some so of those ideas say, yeah. like they act yeah so you're, you're really delayed sorry you can go yeah, <laughs> I was just gonna say instead of having like a super long head tube or like 
uh, you know, dumb, you know, dumb, whatever you have to do, you just do, do the BMX style bar. That's what you're used to anyway. So. Yeah. And that's really actually been helpful for us because while the other brands can always make our colorways and they can always make our bikes the next year, if they really wanted to, when you start to do things that are really, really natural to Fairdale and really, really natural to like the style of riders and style of company that we are, then it just, I don't know, it just sort of sticks and it becomes successful. So those BMX bars on a, on a 700 C or 27, five bike, like that's been like in demand for us that we actually have those handlebars aftermarket. We have a stem that you could buy like any kind of BMX stem you could use, but we have the, the two Sunday stems that we use on our complete bikes. Um, and, and those are the kind of things that I think set Fairdale apart. And while they're not crazy weird ideas, they are different than what's on the market. For sure. Um, let's see. So I think let's, uh, we're gonna start taking it home. Some people have been asking about um, availability. I think that that'd be a good place to close. Uh, you, you'd mentioned that there's nothing really for sale in the store at the moment. Like when's the next uh, kind of shipment? When can people start buying bikes again? Cool, so we'll basically, unfortunately, it's, it's getting close to the winter, but um, basically the October and November, we will be getting more bikes in stock. Um, we will basically have a full model year's worth of bikes come Christmas time. So hopefully people still want to ride bikes when it's cold outside, <laughs> uh, but even for the springtime. So basically towards the end of this year, we will have a full re-up of every single bike that we have. We have a lot of back orders. Um, I don't know what's truly going to be available on fairdalebikes.com at that point because shops have been really supportive and we do have a lot of um, you know people waiting. But yeah, the end of this year for complete bikes is really what you're looking at. Um, and then I saw that that message pop up that said rocket ship, good ship. So we don't technically have any of those in manufacturing right now. There isn't anything that's like, oh, in March, I'm going to have those. Um, but like I said earlier on, we, we had kind of discussed marrying the two, the good ship and the rocket ship together to be like a disc brake, gravel-ish, bigger tire clearance, but you could do whatever you want with it. So that'll take some development and that'll be something that if we do want to do it, that would most likely be what we offer rather than just reissuing those other bikes. Um, but yeah, I mean, the demand for rocket ships really went up as soon as we sold out of all of them, which is hilarious. <laughs> um, I guess that's the way the, the world the good, works. The good, rocket, the good rocket ship. That's uh, yeah. Yeah, the good rocket ship. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, the, the rocket ship was a, it, that bike is, is about as performance, but as like within our own style as I think like really makes sense. Um, but yeah, I mean, the next few years will be cool. Like the, there's a lot of bikes that we want to make and there's a lot of ideas that we have. So, um, as long as I can get Chris, our designer to stop working on everything else and have a chance to actually sit down and design, um, which is what he wants to do, then we'll have some really cool stuff coming out. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to keep some things within the R and D department because we find that to be a really successful approach. Let's R and D it. Let's actually tease it a little bit and then let's like really manufacture it rather than just knee jerk reaction. Like, Oh, you want some, you want some rocket ships? We got them on order, even though we didn't right. really gauge the market or anything. So, right. um, I can't tell you there's going to be a re reissue of the rocket ship or the spaceship within the next nine months. Um, but I can definitely tell you, we're going to offer you more things within that zone over the next couple of years. Yeah. Ooh, the mothership. Ooh, I kind of like that. <laughs> 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 All right, rocket ship, good ship combo would rip. Um, cool. The good ship Wait. lollipop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, well, sweet. I think I'm going to take it home uh, here, guys. We're at our hour mark. Uh, so thank you, Mike, so much for for joining us. I know it was like super last minute on on your end, but uh, you know, super interested in your brand. Wanted to hear more of your story. So thanks for for being on the show. No problem. Thank and, uh, you guys very much. It was it was great to be on here. Yeah, and if you're you're still watching us, there's a hundred of ten, hundred and ten of you still watching. Don't forget to like uh, the video. Help spread it around. And uh, next week, uh, who are we gonna have on the show next week, Mike? Oh, uh, we should have I'm putting you on the spot. Life. I'm putting you on uh, the spot. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully he's watching this. Uh, but hopefully, Medi from uh, State by School will be uh, on with us next week, talking about bikes and all things bike related. Right. Cool. Well, hope you guys enjoyed this uh, chat with uh, the folks from Fairdale. And until uh, next time, keep bikes weird. I think I'm going to try to stick with that. <laughs>